Okay. So we're going to move into your episode. And hey. to, to preface getting into this, um, if you've seen some of our other videos, you know that we make picks at the beginning of the episode. I'm Who, glad it was nobody's pick. I wasn't my own pick. <laughs> well, that's the question. Is like Teresa originally picked you and then, and then switched. switched almost immediately. Sorry. And we say, sorry, please don't hate oh. us. Um, <laughs> honestly, when we make our picks, it's based a lot off of the number of years experience they say they have. And, on, and sometimes that just doesn't translate. And sometimes <laughs> it's like the pick you need to make. So that was kind of our our. Uh, our mindset when we picked those other people and then we all came to realize that we were very far wrong right and uh, i saw the realization in the video <laughs> <laughs> well you know we only go by the 10 second intro clips yeah. that they show on the show we, and we yeah. pause it before they even do any of the tasks or anything oh but yeah before they tell you what you need to make or what material you're going to have we pause it we make our picks based on that first 10 second clip of everybody and so Sometimes it's not very Just reliable. Bite you in the ass. There yeah. was one we picked someone and it came up and it, they had to do this thing and the guy that we had all picked was like, I don't know how to do that thing. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was rough. Actually, after we posted our wrap up episode, you posted uh, a comment on Facebook of that post, which was a picture of you with the other contestants from your episode. Yeah. And I'm assuming that was you guys hanging out at the hotel after a day of mm -hmm. shooting. So have you kept in touch with all the people that were on the episode? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, Andrew's on Instagram. Uh, Mike is on Instagram and Facebook. Bill doesn't have a lot of social media, so we have to actually call Bill. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I joke. I said I had to send him a telegraph the other day. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, he's a busy guy. You know, uh, he's, uh, Bill's, Bill's awesome. Um, what, what you probably didn't know and what was – not said actually is that he's a journeyman smith in the abs yeah. he never mentioned it he never told us he only told us after the fact and we were like well why didn't you say anything about it he says in this competition it doesn't really matter what my skill is he said this is a level playing field almost and you know he was the most humble guy as a matter of fact the first night you know after you know bill uh you got the cut he was like let's go do something so we went out and he bought us all a round of drinks. That's just the kind of guy Bill is. You know, just really cool dude. And, you know, all of them are. Was Andrew's lack of welding experience exaggerated? You know, really, I don't know. But I know that he has since corrected that to the <laughs> extreme. Um, he got himself a MIG welder because he's doing a lot of Damascus now. And, and you know, here's the thing. Bill and, uh, and, and Mike are, you know... Uh, Bill, uh, sorry, Bill and Andrew are fantastic Smiths. Like the stuff that they're doing, and I and I can, I think I can uh, speak for Mike too when he says this. We both look at their work and just go like, "Wow, that's what I want to be doing." You know, because Mike and I are hobbyists. You know, Bill and Mike are professionals. You know, like uh, Bill and Mike. I keep saying Mike because I talk to him all the time. Uh, Bill and Andrew are professionals. Uh, Andrew does it full time, and he is just cranking some stuff out he was working with jason knight recently you know he he's really on a roll and you know mike and i just feel like man they're gonna they're gonna feel bad when they watch this episode and then let's see how these two yahoos make it to the end you know <laughs> <laughs> had you had a lot of experience with the canister damascus uh, before going on a show yes i had done it before and uh, the thing is you get tunnel vision the moment will says you got whatever time it's like everything around you stops and it becomes an instant focus. And what my biggest my biggest mistake I think was that I didn't see the squaring dies for the press were right there in the, on a shelf. And I, I completely forgot they even existed in the time I was there, which you know would have made my job so much easier because instead of compressing it this way, I would have had a complete compression from all sides. Oh. And I forgot about it. I, but I've done canisters before. The first two were absolutely awful. The second two were good. And the third one was a little, and I mean, the, the, the fifth one was a little, eh. That was the one on the show. <laughs> that one was a little, eh, because I was rushed. It looked pretty good. I mean, once you cut yeah. that end off, you know, yeah. you, that, that's a good looking billet. 
Yeah, and it was funny because uh, uh, Will had that cannoli comment, yeah. and it was. And, and the thing is, I was when I was filling it up, I was like, wait a minute, I should just stack these because you didn't. But what I didn't notice is that there were springs about that big, and they're too big for the can. You know, upright the cans about that big, springs are like that. Well, in the mix, there's tiny springs that are like half size. So I kind of like went back and stuck those in and filled it back up because I was like, what the hell am I doing? I caught myself. Right. And and it's funny because I, I guess they didn't have that because they needed to have the, you know, looks like a bunch of cannolis comment, which was funny because, you know, that, I, I thought the same thing. I was like, I'm going to get everything messed up here. Let me do it again. Prior to this episode, obviously you've done blacksmithing work before. Have you ever made an axe head before? Yes, I have. Okay. I've done about well, five or six axes. I mean, that's, that's not a lot. I'm not Liam Hoffman, whose who's job, his bread and butter is essentially making axes. Uh, but, you know, I know how they work. I've done the wraparound form. It's just you take your mild steel, wrap it around, and then you put your core steels. I've done solid billets and then drifting an eye through them. But I've never done one that with the, the, the body and the ta- the flanges and the spike is all, you know, all almost one piece at, at the end of it, you know. Or at least all metal construction. That was not that was on my to-do list, but not with two camera people there and and you know ten thousand dollars on the line. <laughs> we love that you use the turkey pan. It, it gives us like hope for our future. We have that turkey pan it's from Macy's, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that old turkey pan. I literally dug it out of the garage from somewhere. I'm like, okay, I have stuff from like when my great grandmother was still around and I'm just still have stuff from then. I'm like, Turkey pan. I just grabbed that because <laughs> it wouldn't fit in the, in the tank that I had. Remember I prepared for a sword, not an ax. Right. So yeah, that's what happened. It gives us hope that one day if we build our own forge here, turkey we can pan. come out with the Turkey pan. <laughs> if we need to quench something like that. You, Jay, Jay Nielsen does that actually. Jay Nielsen has a turkey roaster filled with oil, and he can adjust the heat so he can have preheated oil for quenching smaller knives. Oh, okay. Well, I, got, I got one of those turkey deep fryers, so yeah, we can do that. Eh. I think it's a little different. <laughs> it's a little different, but I mean, you know, constant. we got Dutch oven. Put that on. So what? Let's get all the kitchenware. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> we don't use it for its intended purposes. Why not? I watched some of your Instagram live last night. I know you oh, happened to God. notice me pop on there. <laughs> I was just wondering um, what type of blade you were working on last night. I mean, you were on for um, a while, but I popped on for maybe five minutes and I saw you working on something. Uh, it was pretty much like the knife you just saw, the little one with the little tail on the end, but right. with, a, with a little uh, bottle opener part right ah, right here. Yeah. Because, you know, you can just get in. So you keep you keep basically you keep it in the sheath and then you just use a pop it open or whatever. It's kind of like a little, just a little extra thing, you know. Oh yeah. So how bad um, did you mess up that axe head that you had to, you know, start over? Because I know oh, you, yeah. you cut those reliefs and you, you wanted to really spread it out, but it just wasn't happening. Was it just not going to be enough? It would have been it would have been enough, but it would have been too thin. Okay. That was the problem I was running into. Um, and quite frankly, I did have enough steel to make that kind of an axe head possible. It just would have been way on the thin side. And it would have been, it, I wouldn't have trusted it because if you forge too thin, you run the risk of cracking in your quench and or, or really bad warping. And I wasn't about to have that with an axe. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to, you can't really straighten a warp out of the edge of an axe because you have so much meat behind it can't just clamp it in vice and then throw it back in the oven to temper. It just isn't going to really work. Uh, was it easy to implement the spike? Yes, uh, because it's all one piece. Right. Uh, so that was one piece of steel right there, and then I had to forge weld the uh, piece of 5160 into the, the little slot that I cut out. So I was intending on making it, you know, one piece and then drifting the eye, uh, but you know, that happened. <laughs> Getting too thin happened. So was putting a, a new head on that spike? Or was that what you did? Yeah, um, what I did was you take the, I, t- I cut a notch in the steel and then I put the piece in there and then closed it back up and then pinned it. I actually put like a pin through and forge welded the whole thing to itself. So even if the weld broke along the edge, 
it was still pinned in there, right. so it wouldn't come flying out from impact. Gotcha. Um, just as agate security, I put that in there. At the end of the day, you couldn't even see it when, they, when I ground it right. somewhat clean. Um, after seeing Mike's axe head break off, were you, were you stressing out that yours would do the same? Uh, honestly, I wasn't worried about it breaking off because of the way it was constructed. I mean, Jay's Jay's crazy, but he couldn't. Uh, he's not that crazy. At the at the worst, I was assu- I was I was worried that the the shaft of it would bend because it's a it's it's like a tubing. It's forty one forty tubing. Uh, people thought it was solid. I'm like, there's no way Jay would have been swinging that if it was solid. It would have weighed like fifteen pounds, you know. Um, that was my concern was that maybe there would be a little point where. It, it, it would have buckled somewhere. So I was worried somewhere that the shaft might take a bend in one direction or the other. The head was pretty well secure on there because I dig it the same way I do tenon joinery, like blacksmithing stuff. I, I, I kind of wrapped it all around itself right. uh, and then put the spike, the top spike actually goes through the center and then is pinned again. So that thing is pinned, pinned, riveted and everything else. Yeah, that's really sturdy. That's not going off anywhere. Yeah. I felt bad when I saw Mike's, the the head break off right there at the point where he was worried about. We were just, I think I had more expression when I saw it, when I saw it break than he did. He was just like, well, Well, and I was just like. And you let out this big (laughs) sigh like, (laughs) I was like, oh, I just felt bad. I was like, ow. It was like last hit too. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you cheered Sean when. Oh yes, yeah. so at the end of our points. episode, Sean was cheering that Teresa ended up not getting the points because yeah. she didn't pick you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you uh, let's see one other one other random question I have here. Um, ah. Again, we were scrolling through the Instagram yesterday, and we saw you had a cello. How long have you played cello? Uh, on and off, on and off, uh, thirteen years. Oh, nice, nice. Um, that, your yeah, so my fir- that was my first major instrument. I mean, piano is there, but I mean, pianos are a little bit more accessible, I think, than a cello. So uh, cello is definitely my first real in- stringed instrument. And then it progressed from there. Uh, if it's got strings, I've either owned it or play it because I really love stringed instruments. Was that something that you initially picked or your parents like, oh, here, play the cello? Uh, no, 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 no. I've, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I the, the, they, I don't know how they felt about my musical pursuits, but um, I just gravitated towards stringed instruments. How was it uh, being in Blade Magazine? I wasn't expecting it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I get this email from uh, Aaron Healy, who was then the editor uh, for Blade Magazine. And we were talking, um, I guess she found me through a mutual acquaintance or something like that uh, because we uh, we were talking on Facebook and then she says you know I'm looking for something to round off the uh, Nightmaker showcase and I said well I showed her a number of blades um, that I had at the time um, and that was the only one that was good enough to put in the magazine in terms of like the picture quality not necessarily the blade itself but the quality of the picture was good enough to get put into the magazine I guess the resolution was better um, there are other knives I wish would have made the cut, but that one made it in there, and I was, I was like, all right, well, I'll talk about that one then. I mean, you mentioned <laughs> earlier on that you just came from a lodge meeting. How long have you been a Freemason? Uh, what year is it now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> five, six years now. Cool. Yeah, Teresa, so Teresa's family has experience with yeah, uh, the my, Freemasons. My dad's a Mason. My parents were both oh. an Eastern Star. I was a Rainbow Girl for a while. Oh, okay. International families. International Order of the Rainbow or something like that? Something. I forget. <laughs> yeah. I was orange. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I actually understand that. Um, uh, 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 a girl I dated, actually, she was in Rainbows when she was younger, and her grandfather... Uh, is the one who got me involved in Freemasonry, so that's pretty cool. You know? um, but yeah, so that's kind of how I learned about rainbows, also because you know a friend of mine is really big on getting them situated and everything in in town. So 
Yeah, I don't. There hasn't. I don't think there's been a mason in my family ever. So I'm the first. I don't have a long lineage. Uh, some people do who can trace it back like to 18 or whatever. I'm like, I don't know my family history beyond 1910. So uh, I remember you did a uh, a little bit of Christopher Walken impression on the uh, um. show. <laughs> Here's the thing. I said so many other things. I was trying to be like, maybe I'll give them a good, profound quote, something cool. No, they get they went with they went with that. <laughs> it's like, what's that? Life changing quote? Something inspirational? Christopher Walken. Let's let that one happen. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Of all the things, it just happened, and I let it happen. You know. <laughs> yeah. We, we I were- just. Like, I think from Brandon huh? that you guys just they sit you down for hours and hours for, for interviews and stuff. It's like the most unpleasant part of it for me. Yeah. <laughs> or, or I think most of us. I'm just not used to speaking in the present tense about stuff that might have happened before or after, you know what I mean? Or, right. uh, afterwards. Right. You know, uh, people say like I, – I just don't understand how people are still like, so do they like take a break and then interview them? I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't just pop you out of what you're doing to do the interview. I mean it's all like – afterwards and everything so you don't sometimes you don't even remember luckily the people who are asking the questions it's their job to remember what you were doing because they're taking notes um and one of them uh was uh mike mike was having trouble with his billet his it was was starting to crumble and everything and that's just a matter of like you know not leaving it in there too long not leaving in there long enough like i i was calling it rotisserie steel I did this whole Julia Child thing while I was out there. I was like, I'll be put it in for exactly 30 minutes and turn it back and forth. Red sesame steel is fantastic. So I'm turning it around, you know, and just letting it just get as high as possible and then consolidating it. And then, you know, Mike cracked his billet open and then he sees this and he's got that look. He walks past me and he's just like, man, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, what's wrong? And then I see it. I said, just get it back in the forge, get it super, super, super hot. And then, you know, compress, get it on the press several times before you even go to the power hammer. And uh, the produ- the guy who was on set, the producer, I guess, asked me, um, so Alex, would you be upset if, you know, if Mike went ahead and you didn't, as a result of you helping him, like let's say that I had a flaw and he didn't, but I helped him out. And I said, I, I said, I'd rather be, what did I say? I'd rather be a good sport and lose and a bad sport and win. And he says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, Brother Mark Twain said it best. It's better to deserve honors and not to have them than to have them and not deserve them. And so that's how I felt about that. I'm like, no, I'm not going to just – if there's something I can do to help, I would try. You know, I wanted to talk to Bill because I was just seeing something happen over there. And because Bill is Bill, I'm like, the guy's going to do something amazing. He's going to kick all of our butts. And it just didn't go that way. And I mean, I know he's way more than capable. It's just no one's used to doing stuff with tiny springs. Right. Yeah. It was very mm-hmm. awkward material work. Yeah. And here's here's something you prop. Here's something that I'm so upset that didn't make the cut. Bill is a professional banjo player. Yeah. Oh, really? Nice. <laughs> Not only that, he brought his banjo to the set and played it during the interview. <laughs> oh. Where is that? I don't know. But he uh, he built it himself. Like he's a machinist, if I remember correctly. So he literally built this banjo over the course of a year on his lunch breaks in the shop. And it was, it was a lot heavier than your average banjo. But, man, was it really powerful, really resonant. And the funniest thing was the night that we came back to the hotel and he had it with him. And he just whips it out in the hotel lobby, this nice, this pretty nice, swanky hotel. And there's all these business people there. And he proceeds to play dueling banjos with flawless precision. And, he, and everyone's just like, what is happening? You know, he's just going to town on this thing, Earl Scruggs style. And that, why that never made the cut, I have no clue. I know there was even me singing because I used to – back in the day, I used to sing for formal occasions. Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Tony Bennett, uh, that kind of stuff. That was like my thing. And they even got me to do a little Frank Sinatra on set. But I guess they couldn't do it because of maybe licensing or something. I don't know. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why they wouldn't put any of that in the show then. Especially the banjo. I think banjo would be shoo it. Yeah, that would be really perfect. Yeah, that would have been beautiful. I was was hoping for that. I was was like, man, I want to see that because, you know, we can hear it while we're, you know, off somewhere else waiting. (laughs) And I'm just hearing 
the song, and if I remember correctly, it's a it's a traditional song from like the Civil War era, and he played it, and I'm just like, man, I never got to hear it, you know, because I was just in the other room somewhere else. I'm hearing the this the tones coming out from the from over there, right. but yeah, so much fun fun stuff that never got aired, but they kept Christopher Walken. I don't understand them. <laughs> it's like professional banjo player. No, let's keep the guy who does the voice because it sounds like Christopher Walken. You know? <laughs> that's that's great, right? Oh. Yeah, it's good TV right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't. I was like, oh my god, my boss is gonna see this. <laughs> Your boss is Christopher Walken. Oh no, that would be so. That would be. <laughs> You just imagine, he's like, it's like, I heard you were talking smack about me. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> What's that line from Joe Dirty? He's like, do it again, and I'll stab you in the face. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. This interview has gone off no, the No, no. Good... Sorry about no. that. <laughs> um, actually, that's all the questions yeah. we had. Um, uh, I Oh, so if Chris and I actually get this going somehow. Yes. Okay. Um, saying that tongs are something you sh- we should maybe try to make. Oh and yeah! I know you guys. You said you make hammers. Would hammers be something that feasibly we would want to try early on <laughs> or later on once we hone some skills? I would say tongs first. Hammers, you know, hammers are dime a dozen essentially. I mean, if you're gonna buy a nice rounding hammer or a, or a custom forge hammer, that's one thing, but you can easily buy a cross bean anywhere, essentially. You can buy any kind of cross bean at just about any hardware store. Uh, tongs, on the other hand, can be a little expensive. Like the tongs that I use, the only pair that I ever purchased, those were 60 something dollars. And they were made by Matt Parkinson, who's uh, over there at Dragon's Breath Forge. Oh, okay. And well, so, um, they are my favorite tongs. Uh, I used them on set, and I used two of my hammers on set. One of which I made, and the other that was purchased. But what what disappointed me is that I, I, there's no video, there's no uh, clip of me actually forging. It just goes from he's making cannolis. <laughs> it's a billet. Here's a full size knife, and I'm like. My friends kind of wanted to see how I forge, and I was like, well, damn. Yeah, they didn't show All right, anything. Live streams. They would just, yeah, just cut to, hey, there's a blade profile. I was like, okay, well, that's how we know that things are going good for someone when they don't really have any camera time because there's nothing, like, bad happening. Well, the funny thing is uh, I had uh, – well, they were showing Mike having trouble at the drill press, and he was visibly upset. Right. What they didn't show was how I was even more freaked out in round two. Like I was losing my mind. I was knocking stuff. I was like, I was trying not to swear. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, I'm, I'm the program director for a, for a nonprofit, a Methodist based nonprofit. So <laughs> a lot of my, my board members and such, they're like pastors and, and everything. So I'm like, try not to swear, try not to swear, try not to swear. But it, I, I'm sorry. A number of f bombs would have been on that particular thing because I was freaking out because I had 30 minutes left and I had a block that big on the end of my 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 uh, my knife. 30 minutes, I need to take this block of white ash and for and, and, and grind it down and pin the handle the the butt cap to the thing. Yeah, no, I was having a full on freak out and I think that because they have us all mic'd up, they can hear us like having our little soliloquy of freaking out and so the camera people are all around me now it's just i look up there's one just like on those one like like track can that goes another guy right here but i'm just like catching this one there might as well have been a 360 to capture my entire freak out all the way around (laughs) but they didn't air that which is probably good because i was um yeah my language was extremely colorful (laughs) right then and there all right well is that it i think that's it that's it so, yeah. uh, we're out of questions. Do you have anything else you wanted to say uh, that we put out to Talk our... about or promote? Well, I mean, yeah, you know, people would think, oh, it's an opportunity to promote yourself. But no, um, <laughs> people already see my stuff. I want people to see, uh, you know, Bill Van Hederen's work. You know, he, he's been trying to get him on Facebook or Instagram, something, you know, to show his work. But he's actually so busy with custom orders, he just doesn't feel the need to do 
the Instagram thing. You know, his, his word speaks for itself. Andrew's already out there. Andrew Wozniak, Colony Knife Co. As a matter of fact, one of my, my other knife that I carry, it's made by him. Um, uh, Mike, Leprechaun, Lair Forge. He's awesome. You know, that's why we get along. We're both blacksmiths who moved into bladesmithing. So we have a very similar uh, a story. And, yeah, like, people know can find Volander Forge because they'll find me. And I'm on a lot of different sites. I'm on the Texas Knife Makers website, the Texas Knife Makers Guild, Balcones Forge, and, like, four other sites. So you'll find me if you plug my name in somewhere. Alex Ruiz will pop up as a bladesmith somewhere, except maybe – the first two search results, uh, which are an uh, an artist, a concept surrealist, or something like that. He does a, you know, H.R. Giger? Yes. The guy who, yeah, he does that kind of really cool, surreal, dark artwork. Like, it's really cool what this Alex Ruiz is doing, uh, but he's not this one. <laughs> he's, he's the more talented Alex Ruiz <laughs> doing the art, you know what I mean? So I that's, think that's, that's probably subjective, depending <laughs> on who's looking at it, because... Uh, <laughs> It's we we are a big fan of yours and uh, the work that you've been oh, doing. Yeah. So, thank yeah. you for then, for coming on with us. We really appreciate the time and um, yeah, that's it. You know, we'll um, we'll we'll put the information for your Instagram page and everything up on the uh, the video description and that sort of thing. And um, follow Alex. Follow yeah. Alex. Yeah. So I can't wait to get, I can't wait to get home and get out of the suit. Yeah. <laughs> just just go right into a Black Sabbath t-shirt and you're like, I'm done for the day. The Black Sabbath shirt's on, I'm just done. <laughs> so it has to be to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody for watching. And again, be sure to follow Alex and this, you know, tune in for more stuff. We got more stuff coming up, more wrap-ups, more interviews, and all sorts of good stuff. And they're gonna try forging. And we're gonna try forging very <laughs> soon. So thanks again, Alex and Adios, everybody. Bye. Peace. Read it. <laughs> 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 All right, so I, I click right here to see part one of our interview with Alex Ruiz. <laughs>